in time the time has changed so that would be 7:30 p.m. India and 2 p.m. in the UK this is our regular program health talk with dr. S. Rawat today's topic is very important uh, today we'll be talking about fatty liver and we'll be talking about management of fatty liver very happy to have a holistic nutritionist with us Seema also my parents and Ashish Today is Ashish's birthday, so happy birthday to Ashish as well. And I will just hand back to the panel while I check my stream health and then we'll get on with our presentations. So here we are, I'm just gonna hand back. Seema, please go ahead, unmute yourself, um, introduce yourself, and then I'll hand it over to my parents and Ashish. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm Seema Nair, I'm a registered holistic nutritionist uh, and here today we are going to discuss more on uh, the holistic approaches towards uh, fatty liver disease and uh, uh, I hope this would be a good discussion and uh, happy birthday to Ashish. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Are we, are we yes, uh, hello. Uh, we are uh, Dr. Sapun's uh, parents and uh, we join uh, the uh, health talk every, uh, every, every Sunday. And uh, there is a saying in our uh, scriptures where it is said that ignorance has no beginning but it has an end. Whereas knowledge has a beginning and it has no end. So we are uh, pursuing knowledge. It has no, no end. So we join uh, every Sunday, every weekend for the health talks. We find them uh, very beneficial. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sapan. God bless you. And God bless everyone. Namaste. And we are getting uh, very informative and useful talk from Sapan and uh, Sapan is helping us. Thank you so much. You are so kind. God bless you. Ashish. Ashish. Good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much for your uh, warm wishes. Uh, thank you once again. And um, um, good morning uh, once again. Uh, glad to uh, attend here or I rather I thank um, Dr. Sapin for inviting us and uh, well said uncle uh, you know uh, knowledge has uh, no uh, end. here to learn something from Dr. Rawat so today's topic is uh, a very interesting one it's about fatty liver um, I'm here to learn a few more things from uh, you and uh, from Seema also thank you Thank you, everyone. Great. So I'll just go ahead and start presenting my screen. Here we are. So today's talk is management of fatty liver. Now today primarily because we have a nutritionist, a dietitian with us, we will be talking mostly about conservative management, not so much medical management. So let's talk about fatty liver. Uh, because all this is my 30th blog and because most of my blogs are on COVID-19, I would like to just put in a little COVID-19 related fact or observation 
that here is a study which showed that patients with fatty liver are associated with significantly increased odds of hospitalization by because of COVID-19 and that's because we know inflammation is a risk factor and fatty liver is an inflammatory condition. So first we'll talk about what the condition is, is epidemiology and diagnosis. I would also like to, um, we are live today on YouTube and Facebook and anyone who has questions about this are more than welcome to type questions on YouTube chat as well as Facebook. So we often describe non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NAFLD as an umbrella diagnosis which has a spectrum of various clinical stages. This can be ranging from a simple fatty liver to fibrosis, cirrhosis and even liver failure. And so the entire umbrella comes under NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It can be described as a hepatic or liver manifestation of metabolic syndrome because there is a strong association between this and obesity, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes, as well as high cholesterol. Most patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease will be asymptomatic Although when questioned more directly, about 50% do describe symptoms of fatigue, tiredness, and upper abdominal discomfort. So if we were to image everyone in the risk populations, up to 70 to 90% could have simple fatty deposition. And the, 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 the Definition of fatty liver is when the fat content of the liver exceeds over 5% of total volume of the liver. About 10 to 30% of those could have inflammation starting already called NASH, non-alcoholic statue hepatitis. So the fatty liver itself, we describe it when there is accumulation of triglycerides and other fats. And that is because there is an aberration in the deposition and removal clearance of fat. Now let's talk about the minority of cases, 10 to 30%, which can be NASH, which means non-alcoholic statitio hepatitis. Wherever you get the word itis, it means inflammation. So in these patients, not only do they have increased fat deposition, which means not only does the liver contain more than 5% fat? There is also now inflammation going on. Now clinically, we can pick that up through blood tests because the liver enzyme levels, ALT, AST, gamma GT, tend to be increased in these patients. By definition, this can only be diagnosed through a biopsy, but because it is an invasive procedure, that is rarely done these days. Often we will use a clinical picture to make a presumption that these patients have not just a fatty liver, but also an inflamed liver. So just some statistics in the US of uh, steatosis, that, that word means fat deposition, affects about 25 to 35% of the population. If a person is obese, about 80% of them can have fatty liver. But notably, Asian studies, and that can be both South Asian, Indian subcontinent, as well as Chinese, um, it is seen that liver disease can happen at a lower BMI, a lower body mass index. The average age for inflammation to start is 40 to 50. Average age for cirrhosis is 50 to 60 years old. Some degree of fibrosis or cirrhosis of liver can be present in 15 to 50% of patients who have inflammation. Um, generally, in clinic, we tend to find that out through something called a fibro scan because that measures the elasticity, elasticity of the liver and gives us an idea as to whether it's starting to become fibrotic which means scar formation. After 10 years of having inflammation in the liver, about 30% of patients will have developed scarring of the liver. 
Now, there, for a long time, we felt that fatty liver is a benign condition, and a lot of my patients um, tell me, oh, by the way, doctor, I was told I've got a fatty liver about 10, 15 years ago, and nothing was done about it, and I was told, well, most Indian people have fatty liver anyways. We are now starting to find out that it is you know, rather important. Uh, it is the most common cause of liver transplant in women now in the Western world. Uh, for men, it's the second most common cause of liver transplant after alcoholic liver disease. And it's the third most common cause of liver cancer in men as well as women. And that is after alcohol-related liver cirrhosis and chronic hepatitis C, although the numbers are going up. One reason the clinicians will always tell you, will often tell you, that a fatty liver is not important I feel is because it's not so important for the liver itself. The most common cause of death in a patient with fatty liver is actually a heart attack or a stroke, cardiovascular disease. The second most common cause of death is cancers. Certain cancers which we know, for example, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, etc., which are related to obesity and metabolic syndrome. And liver failure is the third most common cause of death in these patients. So having a fit of fatty liver may not be so important for the liver because the liver is a very forgiving and regenerating organ, but it's certainly very important for that person as a whole because their all cause mortality and morbidity is increased. Interestingly, about a third of cases with non-alcoholic steady to hepatitis will have antibodies, autoantibodies, including ANA, anti-nuclear antibody. I find that quite interesting because there are several theories as to why autoimmune conditions and autoimmune conditions include various conditions like um, low thyroid disease, vitiligo, which is those white patches on your skin, um, diabetes even. And there are various theories as to why those get triggered. Now we know that there is a genetic susceptibility as an example. HLA is a certain um, genetic susceptibility. However, there, there have been theories about viral infections causing inflammation and triggering an autoimmune response, but there is also a theory around whether chronic inflammations like this may be triggering autoimmunity. Uh, Last time when we had our talk about obesity, we talked about leptin and it's also got a important role to play in why fat deposits in the liver. And there are also pro-inflammatory cytokines, which we've often studied in the context of COVID-19, such as uh, TNF-alpha, which also appear to be involved in the inflammation. So now let's talk about management strategies. Clearly, if there is associated obesity, high cholesterol, insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes, those conditions need to be managed. Uh, generally, a calorie restricted diet would be recommended, which would be about 600 kilocalories less than what a person needs to maintain their current steady weight, aiming to lose about half to one kilogram per week. And often they would be given a target weight as an example, 10% reduction in weight. It's very important to avoid saturated fats, and that would be things like butter, ghee, fried foods, especially deep fried. Also, simple carbohydrates, which I'm sure um, our holistic nutritionist, Seema, will be touching in more detail, but these are refined, processed sugary carbs and also non-sugary carbs but those which are refined and processed. Increasing activity, physical exercise also reduces fatty liver and alcohol intake should be minimized. I would say half to one drink per day should be the maximum regardless of gender. If you have inflammation then perhaps zero, none at all.
there was increasing evidence that a high fructose diet, particularly high fructose corn syrup, which can be present in sodas, preserved foods, salad dressings, sweetened yogurts, ice creams, it has a very direct effect on developing fatty liver. And there appears to be a mechanism related to depletion of ATP and also increased uric acid production, which is uh, causative for gout. In mouse models of NASH, a high fat and high fructose diet, which is essentially an American fast food diet, resulted in more liver damage than a high fat diet alone. And in that study, when those mouses were made to do exercise, swim for one hour, five days a week, it prevented the development of fatty liver. So while a high fructose diet and a high fat diet cause it, exercise can also prevent it. Clearly, insulin resistance is a problem and exercise will reduce insulin resistance. And that is partly by increasing the muscle mass. So while cardio exercise is useful, it's also important to increase muscle building exercises. In a trial in which liver biopsies were done after exercise with 7% weight loss, an improvement in liver biopsy was seen, although inflammation would reduce with 10% weight loss or more. Briefly, we'll talk about medical management as well. So there was this study by Foster in which atorvastatin, vitamin C and vitamin E reduced uh, fatty liver after four years. So that is so something which needs to be borne in mind. I would like to just um, throw in a word of caution. Vitamin E has been suggested to be implicated in prostate cancer. And so it's very important to discuss any supplements, including even vitamins with your, with your doctor. Um, omega-3 acids may help if a patient has high triglycerides and I, I'll see a lot of low HDL as well. I tend to recommend a high EPA omega-3. Here at Walmart, there's a, there's a brand called Wiley's EPA Extra Alaskan Salmon Fish Oil, which is which contains a three to one ratio. So I, I recommend a minimum of three to one ratio of omega-3. When I say three to one ratio, I mean three to one of EPA to DHA. Type two diabetes drugs, which help weight loss, including drugs like Ozempic, Jardians, Metformin, are likely to slow down progression of fatty liver. One more drug, which is used for diabetes called pioglitazone, has been shown in studies to reduce fatty liver although it does tend to cause fluid retention and weight gain. So, and it is not really first line treatment for diabetes anymore. So that really has to be discussed with your doctor. Certain other drugs which have shown some positive results are azetamib, gemfibrozil, or sodiol, and supplements which may help include black tea, uh, black coffee, green tea, curcumin, and milk thistle. Uh, in patients who are significantly obese, bariatric surgery has been shown to reverse fatty liver. And certain therapies which are under investigation include NAC, n cysteine which incidentally is on my uh, supplement protocol for COVID-19, and CPAP for patients who have sleep apnea. At the end, I'm just sharing some references and a disclaimer. So that's my talk done. Next, I will hand over to Holistic Nutritionist Seema Nair. So Seema, uh, please a uh, quick introduction again of yourself and you can then start your screen share. Hello, uh, I'm Seema Nair. I'm a registered holistic nutritionist. And today I'm going to present about uh, fatty liver disease and how do we holistic approaches towards fatty liver disease. One second, let me just... Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, so, we can. 
okay so 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 you can see this diagram we have a fatty liver at the left hand side and the healthy liver on the right hand side so th there are few things that we need to focus uh, for the treatment of a fatty liver disease first would be more like a losing weight exercising regularly eating a healthy food avoiding carbonated drinks avoiding avoid eating fried and high fat food and considering nutritional supplements so what exactly is fatty liver fatty liver or uh, is more in medical terms as steatosis and it is it is the build up of fat in the liver liver has some amount of fat in it but the presence of fat which makes more than 5 to 10% of fat in the liver can be a bit dangerous it is common and reversible process and can be changed with some changes in lifestyle and diet so what are some of the symptoms of fatty liver so certain symptoms of fatty livers may include weight loss abdominal pain feeling tired weakness nausea confusion poor judgment or trouble concentrating now how do one diagnose a fatty liver there are some techniques to diagnose fatty liver first is a blood test so certain liver enzymes might be treated uh, which may be higher than normal so presence of higher level of such enzymes may denote fatty liver then there's an ultrasound so fatty liver may be found by seeing the image of liver in the ultrasound the fat in the liver will be seen as a white area the next one is liver biopsy a needle will be inserted in into the liver and the tissue will be taken out for certain tests so uh, when you think about fatty liver what are the enzymes that they in in particular they look at so what exactly does the liver function test show a liver function test it evaluates the level of liver enzymes and by products like albumin and bilirubin present in the blood so this levels indicate how well your liver is working through numerous enzymes can be included on liver test there are three main liver enzymes that doctor used to detect the issues with the liver first is the alt that is al alanine transmisane so this enzyme it belongs to a group of enzymes called transaminase also known as amino transferase this enzyme facilitate amino acid synthesis alt is only found in small amounts in other tissues making it an accurate sign of liver problems then ast aspartate transaminase this enzyme is also classified as transaminase and may also be called aspartate amino transferase and in addition to being found in liver can also be found in the muscle tissue then the alp this enzyme is essential for protein metabolism and can be found in liver bone and other tissues and then comes the ggt that is gamma uh, glutamyl transferase uh, is found in the liver as well as other organs like the pancreas and intestine now what are the causes of fatty liver so there are many causes of fatty liver which may include that is the drinking too much of alcohol obesity hyperlipidemia or high levels of fat in the body diabetes rapid weight loss genetic inheritance side effects of certain medications too much iron in the body hepatitis c which cause inflammation in the body and what are the risk fa factors of fatty liver so certain risk factors may include being obese or having a type 2 diabetes malnutrition excessive alcohol use of high cholesterol and high triglyceride level taking excessive uh, dose of certain medication and metabolic syndrome now there are what are the different types of fatty liver so there are two main types of fatty liver first is the alcoholic liver disease this disease occur when drinking too much of alcohol as a heavy drinking damages the liver liver can't break down the fat resulting in the accumulation of fat in the liver so the other one is non alcoholic fatty liver disease nafld the cause of this fatty liver is not known it can be caused due to obesity diabetes high cholesterol or can be genetic it, it is run in, in into families but it is uh, but this is not caused due to alcohol but there are other two types which are non alcoholic steatotrophic 
for hepatitis slash as the fat built up enough in the liver the liver swells up and the actual cause of the disease is not known and it impairs the liver function now let's see the symptoms like some of the symptoms are like appetite loss nausea vomiting yellowing of skin jaundice abdominal pain ac acute fatty liver of pregnancy like acute fatty liver is a rare condition of pregnancy which can be life threatening so symptoms begin in the third trimester uh, semester uh, which may include persistent nausea vomiting then general malaise pain in the upper right abdomen and jaundice so thinking about some preventative measures we can uh, take to avoid getting fatty liver disease those there are some supplements that help to support your liver uh, the first supplement i would like to talk is about milk thistle uh, so it's it's shown in clinical trials involving silymarian the active ingredient in milk thistle but researchers found that the herb it rejuvenates and repair the damages uh, to the liver so it's uh, it is recommended taking around 200 mg of milk thistle three times a day then for uh, pc that is phosphatidylcholine uh, this is an extract of lecithin and it also helps the liver cells regenerate and try getting 900 mg twice daily so other supplements like curcumin that's the active uh, ingredient in the spice turmeric has a long list of benefits including heart health and fewer signs of aging a recent study has also found that curcumin protects liver cells from the type of damage commonly found in fatty liver and related conditions so recommended dosage is somewhere around 500 mg daily but you should be always careful if you are taking any blood thinning medications uh, including comadin or warfarin uh, you have to uh, consult your physician before adding curcumin to your daily regime then vitamin e vitamin e is also a powerhouse of antioxidant and it also prevents uh, damage to cell membranes among other things look for products containing natural vitamin e which you can identify by its chemical name d alpha tocopherol the form d alpha tocopherol is a synthetic and not nearly as effective it is recommended to take uh, around 400 ius uh, daily and as i told phospho uh, phosphate uh, dicholine uh, this extract of lecithin helps the liver cells degenerate and you can take it around to 900 mg twice daily so uh, let's talk about some of the home remedies uh, for fatty liver disease uh one of the home remedies i can talk about is apple cider vinegar uh it helps by reducing fat accumulating in the liver and by inducing weight loss it also promotes healthy liver functioning by reducing the inflammation all you have to take is a glass of warm apple cider uh vinegar and water and drink it twice daily before your, your meals you can also add honey to enhance the taste uh you can repeat it or you can take it on regular basis uh then lemons lemons are also a rich source in vitamin c and antioxidants and that also helps with the liver produce glutathione this enzyme neutralizes the toxins in the liver thereby promotes promoting detoxification all you need to do is squeeze a lemon in a glass of water and drink it twice or thrice a day for some weeks this will also help in reducing the fat accumulated in the liver thereby treating fatty liver disease naturally so green tea studies have also shown that green tea also helps uh, people with uh, non alcoholic fatty liver disease and it also is enriched with high density catechins which improve the liver functioning and prevents the fat accumulation and uh, you can drink ar around 2 uh, 3 to 4 cups of green tea regularly Uh, to keep the fatty liver disease at the bay then turmeric this spice uh, acts as a natural healer for all conditions the valuable antioxidants of this spice are what you need to treat fatty uh, liver disease naturally turmeric improves your body's ability to digest fats and prevents the accumulation in the liver you can also uh, prepare a turmeric drink by adding 1/4 of teaspoon of turmeric to two glasses of water drink this daily to prevent fatty liver uh, fatty liver disease you can also add turmeric to a glass of milk and drink in 
uh, daily for the same effect. Uh, it also improves the body's ability to digest fat and prevent fatty liver disease. So one of the important, uh, uh, like you can add papaya as a fruit and papaya uh, in Ayurveda also papaya, uh, the pulp and the seeds are very effective in uh, burning the dietary fats, thereby preventing fatty liver disease naturally. For this, you need to eat a slice of papaya with honey every day. You can also grind the seeds, mix it with water and drink it daily for the same effect. The pulp and the seeds of papaya are effective in burning fats and preventing fatty liver disease. Then uh, Indian gooseberry or amla is another effective home remedy for fatty liver disease. This fruit is also rich in vitamin C and this essential vitamin ensure proper functioning of liver. It works by removing toxins from the liver. You can either eat it raw or you can add it in your cooking. Now some uh, interesting tips. So studies have shown that having a cup of tea in the morning uh, or two, that is the black uh, coffee, uh, has a du dual benefit of uh, helping you wake up and support your liver. Interestingly, a numbers of studies have also shown that coffee consumption uh, to be associated with the lower AST, GGT, ALP, and ALT levels. Uh, scientific evidence suggests that uh, there may be a crucial link between gut health and the liver function. Bacteria are key to creating a healthy gut microbiome that supports digestive health. Not all bacteria are bad. In fact, lots of bacteria strains are beneficial for gut health and even liver health. Then exercising regularly. regularly. Uh, physical inactivity is important contributor factor for fatty liver disease. To reverse this, engage in some type of physical workout like going for a walk, jogging, jumping, rope, doing yoga or any type of physical workout can be helpful in treating this. And naturally, keep 30 minutes separately to for your workout. Start start doing a low impact exercise and then move to a high impact workout. Uh, start under a guidance of an expert, and this will help in speeding your metabolism effectively and help you maintain proper liver function. This will be fully effective if you couple it with a he healthy and balanced diet. Now, the first step to prevent uh, fatty liver disease is to lose weight. And here are some steps to reduce body fats. So making a healthy life change is a process that involves practice and commitment. No one is expected to transform from a sedentary and obese into an active slim in one week. However, gradually incorporating healthy full changes in your routine guarantee steady weight loss and improved liver health. The following five steps do not require a doctor's prescription, but you can make a lasting impact on your liver's longevity. Carbonated beverages. If you are a soda drinker, make the switch to a seltzer or a sparkling water with a squeeze of lemon while still offering bubbly refreshment. Seltzer is free of fructose and chemical sweetness, both of which lead to a fat accumulation in the liver. In addition, adding fresh lemon juice aids the liver in defending against damage then moving your body the longer you sit in front of the tv computer tablet or any other type of screen the worse off your liver is study shows that even the modest changes in physical activity that may or may not lead to weight reduction can improve liver function test produce is perfect in reality fruits and vegetables just need to be washed or maybe peeled or pitted before being consumed this makes them the ideal convenience food much faster and better for your liver than fast food burgers and fry meals. Fresh fruit and vegetable provide live enzymes, antioxidants, fiber, minerals, and natural sugars needed for healthy full liver cells. Consume at least five servings of produce each day to steer your body away from obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So as I told, like having a plenty of produce, like bright colored, fresh, organic produce are the best picks of fatty liver diseases. Brightly colored fruits and vegetables are rich, not only in antioxidants, but it also combats liver inflammation. Fruits and vegetables contain fiber, which helps to remove the excessive fat from the bloodstream. In addition, produce is packed with vitamins and minerals needed for optimal liver function. Produce especially valuable to a fatty liver include blueberries, cherries, raspberries, oranges, 
grape fruit papaya tomato spinach broccoli kale asparagus artichokes mustard greens and bell pepper anything that helps to uh, support your liver whole grains this complex carbohydrates provide a steady supply of energy it helps to stabilize blood sugar levels and low on the glycemic index in addition whole grains contain vitamin and minerals needed for optimal liver function good choices of whole grains for fatty livers include oats bulgur quinoa spelt barley brown rice wild rice and rye healthy fats unsaturated fats and omega 3 fats are good for a liver's health because they reduce inflammation healthy fats are found in nuts seeds cold water fish and vegetable oils more specifically foods such as coconut oil avocados flaxseed oil wild salmon and mackerel help reduce liver inflammation protein in every meal protein at every meal especially breakfast helps to balance the blood sugar level and insulin levels reducing sweet cravings and provide the liver with the amino acids needed to function optimally so good protein choices includes egg protein shakes nuts seeds fish organic free range chicken and lean grass fed meat so how to make the fatty liver diet easier like any other diet which demands fewer processed foods and more natural food eating the fatty liver diet can take work and preparation it means more shopping more cooking and many people end up failing to follow it simply because it's so time consuming so key take away from this presentation is to make making a sustained lifestyle changes is the best way to normalize your liver liver enzymes levels and support overall health and wellness elevations in the liver enzymes may be reflective of the health of your organs make sure to review your results with your doctor and follow his or her guidelines to best treat underlying causes as we deal with difficult circumstances in our life it is also important um, important to find an outlet for stress try different activities to determine what stress reliever works best for you exercise meditation or yoga may provide stress relief for some for others reading journaling or spending time outdoor is the best way to find peace whatever you your go to reliever is making it a part of your daily routine is the some way can help to manage your psychological stress thank you thank you thank you sima that was really helpful great so let's finish off now with all of us now i'm going to put everyone on the spot what we will do next is out of everything we just um listen to what things have you already incorporated in your life which reduce your risk of metabolic syndrome your risk of fatty liver your risk of inflammation generally in your body so i'm i'm going to start with myself and what things i you don't necessarily have to be doing i'm not a perfect person as as, as we often say do as i say don't do as i do you know we we're not always model patients ourselves uh, but i'd like to give you the my list of aspirations as what things i would like to do and of course i'm not able to do all of those things i have to be honest with you and then we will move um to my parents and then ashish and then at the end seema as to what of these things you are currently aspiring to do you don't have to necessarily be doing these things what things are you aspiring to do in your life which would reduce your risk of inflammation uh poorly controlled sugar high blood pressure obesity and fatty liver so i'll start with myself and then after that it will be my parents then ashish and then ending with seema so i'm going to start with myself so the first thing that i do is well get tested at least once a year i recommend to my patients to get a test you know check their liver function levels inflammation levels i do check uh, high sensitivity crp as well cholesterol sugar you know unless 
weigh yourself every day unless you are measuring these things you will not know where you stand and that is probably one of the best ways of motivating yourself if you know that your a1c is creeping up into the risk range if you know that your high sensitivity crp is creeping up into the risk range or your blood pressure is borderline for example that can be a great motivator for you to start making some changes I have to say, as we go through medical school, as we go through school education, we are hardly told very much about nutrition and lifestyle, what things are important to us. You know, we're all told that, you know, you want to be successful in life, you want to, you know, achieve great things. We're not really told how to look after our health very much. We're not told what to eat, what not to eat, what, uh, what kind of lifestyle to follow. And these things, well, our whole series, uh, we had a video on obesity two weeks ago. We had a, a video on how to reduce inflammation in your body a few weeks prior to that. So this whole series is to try to increase knowledge and education about how we need to lead our lives. So clearly exercising is important. Um, every member of our family, all four of us have a Fitbit and we have a group within that Fitbit so we can track each other's activity level so we can urge each other to get more steps in. You know, if you're having a lazy day, we, we didn't go for our daily walk or we haven't done any sports, we didn't go to the basement to play table tennis, then it, it, it spurs around. Even later on in the day, we might go and play some table tennis because we haven't gotten our steps in. So that's one way of you know, invoking some exercise within the family being mindful of what you're eating and drinking very important uh, as we discussed in the two previous talks any food which increases shelf life it it, it likely has an effect on reducing your lifespan it that's a sad reality all the preservatives uh, in particular fructose uh, high fructose corn syrup which is available in most of the things in your fridge be it sweetened yogurt, salad dressings, ice creams, things which appear to be quite healthy can be quite unhealthy. And the, and the extent to which this causes obesity and fatty liver, we are just, just starting to find out over the last few years. A lot of these preservatives that, that we had um, you know, lying in, inside our freezer, these chicken nuggets and hot dogs and sausages, and things which are lying in the shelves, like your canned beans, we have to realize that, that there is no shortcuts. When something is there to make things easier for you, there's going to be a downside as well. And more and more, those downsides are becoming obvious. And that's why in our previous talks on reducing inflammation and reducing obesity, we talked about whole foods. Uh, we talked about different types of diets, including we talked about the paleo diet and the Mediterranean diet which we tend to focus more on whole foods, fruits, vegetables, natural products, trying to reduce uh, processed, industrialized, commercialized products. And just the other day, I was talking to my son about the issue we have with food production in this world. You know, it's, I think this is a global problem. The fact that, um, and I feel it equals uh, climate change as, as a big problem. The fact that here in the West, we have readily available processed industrialized foods which are cheap but most unhealthy and it, it can be more expensive uh, to buy organic uh, vegetables from a local farmer than than buying something which is inside a can but has been processed in south africa it's been shipped all the way or come by air it's gone through an industrial processing uh, process. However, despite of that, it's cheaper than that natural produce you can get from the farmer next door. So there, there is surely something wrong in that system. And while we have excessive food in the West, you go into a supermarket, it's completely full. A lot of that food goes out before the expiry date and gets wasted. A lot of food waste happens after people buy the food. On the other hand, in the East, we have huge shortages of food. We have starvation. And so there is a food problem we have in the world. And 
just like we get together to talk about climate change, I think food needs to be talked about as well at an international level to fix that kind of discrepancy that we have. But just remember, every time you open a can, every time you take something out of a freezer, just remember there are preservatives, there is fructose, there are things in there which will cause inflammation within your body. And you want to try to reduce that as much as you can. There are certain types of things as well that you can try. Um, I feel that um, eating late in the day is a problem for most people. However, most people find it difficult to escape that. So you know, they work through the day, nine to five perhaps, they drive back home for an hour, they get home six o'clock, start cooking. By the time they have their food at seven or eight o'clock at night, that is not a very healthy way of going about it because you won't be burning a lot of calories, doing a lot of exercise after that. It's likely most of that food will just go straight into storage. It'll go into your tummy, into your liver. And you want to avoid that. So I personally try to eat by 5 p.m. and not have any carbs after 5 p.m. In fact, the only things I have after 5 p.m. is uh, fruit and, and perhaps some salad. And so, you know, it might be celery with hummus, it might be carrot sticks, but it's not going to be anything high in carb after 5 p.m. And you could describe that as a form of intermittent fasting as well. But some degree of intermittent fasting is also required to cleanse your liver, to clean out all the debris. You can't just keep feeding sugar to yourself all day and expect there to be no repercussions of that. There will be in the longer term. The other thing also that you can do is try to reduce snacking. Snacking is a huge problem for us. And because food has become so available, particularly here in the West, and affluent people in India and China as well, food is overly accessible. There is this tendency or this habit that we have developed that every few hours we need to go into the kitchen and grab something to eat. And that is, that is unhealthy as well. If you do snack, try to do something healthy. Maybe use celery sticks with hummus. I suggest that green tea and black coffee is probably a very good alternative to snacking. If you feel you need to put something in your tummy, just have some green tea or black coffee if you can tolerate that. And you will find that has beneficial effects as long as you don't put sugar or milk, it will not have any major calories or sugar and it, it will also provide you some satiety and you're likely to snack a bit less. So these are a few little tips that I go by uh, to try to maintain that healthy lifestyle. And so I'll move on now, uh, pass on to my parents to talk about what things they do. Uh, to try to live that healthy lifestyle. Thank you so much, Dr. Sapan. Uh, we are feeling uh, right. We are uh, having uh, fresh food, fresh vegetables, fruits, everything daily we are having. And doing it uh, in the morning, uh, at least one and a half hour doing yoga or exercises. So we are keeping fine. I'm not even taking uh, medicine for allergy. So I'm not taking any medicine. I'm all right. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Yeah, well, uh, so far as I am concerned, I am in uh, mid-70s. And uh, as everyone knows, uh, at this age, if uh, we go for one test, the doctors will say you have this problem also. So we come back with two, three more uh, <laughs> ailments. So, so I don't bother much about what do I do take care yeah. in the sense that uh, as she was saying uh, we take uh, uh, fresh vegetables, fresh, 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 fresh uh, uh, fruit, uh, fruit and uh, of course uh, I'm, we are also taking uh, these uh, vitamins, vitamin, vitamin yeah. E I take, curcumin we take, phosphate we take, uh, not apple vinegar but apples we use, lemons we use. Uh, sometimes we use green tea, sometimes we use bl black tea, but it's, it's fine. Papaya also we are using, amla also we are using, and exercising daily without fail. Well, uh, you see, one thing uh, in all the uh, old elderly people is that all of them have some kind of or many kinds of uh, diseases, ailments. But what is not common in all is all don't take daily exercises whereas we take daily exercises so that is the only difference and after that as uh, in our uh, Gita said karmane vadikaste maha phale so <laughs> we do our karmas 
we do our duties and uh, be uh, relaxed thank you thank you so much everyone i'll just uh, make a comment about what daddy said there so you know when we talk about health there is a there is a correlation there is a combination of genetics environmental factors lifestyle factors and so there are certain things you can change what we describe as modifiable factors like our exercise levels our diet and there are certain things we can't change for example you live in delhi there's a lot of pollution you can't change that that's a non modifiable risk factor uh um, getting older we have certain genetic tendencies which are passed down from the family we cannot change that so the 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 purpose is not for us to all live forever no one of no none of us will live forever it is just for us to try to reach our maximum potential you know health is not very different from education when we see a child we don't want every child to become the the president of the united states we don't want every child to become a nasa astronaut we just want them to reach their maximum potential and that is the same with health there will be environmental factors you can change genetic factors you can't change but there are modifiable risk factors which you can change which include exercise diet etc and so we just want to reach our maximum potential that is the that is what we're aiming to do so let's move to ashish now ashish uh, this this is this kid doesn't have to be what you do in in real life this can be aspirations as well but what things are you doing ashish to try to reduce inflammation in the body reduce risk of diabetes blood pressure um heart disease and all those things which are so common in 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 our um, community first of all um, thank you uh, dr rawat and thank you seema ji uh, it was a really good one and there were some um i openers also so um and as uh, you said nobody is perfect uh, we all strive to have a healthy lifestyle and um i have a, a decent healthy lifestyle i would say um i eat um, four to five uh, fruits per day um, my breakfast is healthy proper protein intake um limited carbs plus uh, workouts also so covid is it's a tough one but otherwise um i will always have five uh, workouts every week minimum four to five and uh, they include um cardios and uh, weight trainings and uh, hit sessions also um it's a tough one in uh, the covid so especially canadian winters they are harsh also um 16 14 to 16 weeks you cannot do any outdoor activities so it's limited to indoor activities i i try to um set up a mini gym so i bought weights during this covid i do those one sometime and um, um i will show you even when we are sitting watching there's a small cube here um it's even it's um, one third of the steps you walk it's not going to burn like regularly an hour jogging walking any activity would be 500 calories but this one may be 150 calories but there's something you know you are moving your legs uh, uh, burning a little bit of calories it's it's a kind of as i mentioned a couple of weeks ago it's say my philosophy is both sides of the equation um calories in take and calories out takes yes but um one thing i learned and um i will try my best to do is um i love my sodas i love i cannot live without a soda after my lunch <laughs> that's how i'm going to reduce and uh, then some of the canned foods i um foods i didn't know that they also have a corn syrup or something and that's the beauty of joining these programs or your blogs so we'll try to cut those one that's it thanks ashish i would just like to um since uh, ashish and i we are both uttarakhandis 
uh, and obviously my parents as well i just like to t- talk something about which something we mentioned in the previous blog on obesity which is called the thrifty gene hypothesis so this is uh the hypothesis that people who came who originated from uh, climates and places where there was more fast and famine so feast fast and famine which means you get a lot of food during crops and then after that there is a period when you are you become hunters hunter gatherers and there is not as much food we our body then starts uh, genetically modifying and this is over thousands of years to store more glycogen and store more sugars because that's what benefits us you know through the darwinian evolution survival of the fittest those people who can get through the famines those people who can get through the uh, fasting periods uh, become the survivors however now that food has become plentiful that thrifty gene has become a handicap for us because we are now more likely to become diabetic even with normal lifestyle because of that genetic um, uh, you know change which has evolved over time and so here um i'm involved with the uttarakhandi community and i find that we have significant rates of uh, obesity and uh, diabetes and part of that uh, would come down to the thrifty gene uh, hypothesis because just to put it very simply people who are designed to be in the mountains who are designed to have a very active lifestyle have suddenly come into cities sitting on sofas eating a lot of food a lot of food is available not doing a lot of exercise and then the the diabetes comes very quick to those people hence um uh, just like ashish was describing with that qb and parents were describing with exercise for us people is perhaps even more important it's important for everyone no doubt but for us people probably even more important because um our genes cannot handle all this sugar all this food and this lack of activity so let's move to seema and uh, seema you can give us your wish list or ideal ideally how you would like to reduce risk of obesity risk of inflammation risk of fatty liver so seema over to you yeah so so the the most important thing what uh, uh, thing would be like to get a, a yearly physical check up and from that as you told like we come to know lot of parameters like uh, the bi- biomarkers for inflammation then doing a regular liver test thyroid test blood sugar levels so we know the standing like where we are exactly right and then based on that it's not like yeah, the doctor will directly put you on a medication so what is your approach towards it how are you responsible towards this condition right rather than blaming others taking that responsibility and working towards it right for example if somebody is having some problem with thyroid instead of like there are people who are on thyroid medication and that is not working but what are the things can i do to support my thyroid health right what supplements i can do so there are many things whenever i focus anything i always go with the mind uh, body mind connection any any problem like any disease right why is it setting in for us right like whenever we look there is a liver issue we always think about anger resentment like some emotions that is trapped inside us and we are not able to express especially for thyroid you have some problem uh, you are not able to express yourself freely so that affects the thyroid glands so same whenever i am approaching something i will always uh, work on the b- body mind connection along with other things but that is also an important thing right only you are working on supplements and doing nothing won't help so there are many things that you have to incorporate like you have to start start it slowly one day it won't work it will take some time so that is what uh, one thing i can talk about then as you told that eating mindful eating like planning your meals preparing like we can you just prepare for this week what all you will be getting from the grocery getting rid of all the frozen dinners everything that has lot of preservatives you don't want that for your family right and you don't want to buy any junk and keep it the thing is once you get addicted to, to those type of foods the next time you visit the grocery store you will look at it and it's it's so uh, like it's like when you see something you just want to have it that's the thing right and you cannot eat just one you want to eat it more and more so this is like 
like a cycle every time you go you want to get it you will eat it so you have to you have to be very mindful while doing all this grocery thing and then cooking meals at home right avoiding certain types of foods like some foods you really like it but you know when you look at the ingredients the list of ingredients then you will be thinking oh my god these are the things that we have to ingest right so so those type of awareness if it comes earlier that is better and uh, as you told like canned beans and all it is easy convenience you can just but you don't know what is what is in that pre what preservatives is in that right and we see like they say some uh, problems uh, for the bpa poison bpa will be there because they don't have the proper lining for the cans people just buy it and they just have it so the thing is buying the beans soaking it then cooking it sprouting it it takes time and nobody has that time and then your health is at a stake right so this is what step by step you have to slowly start um, making the, those changes uh for some of the clients who are approaching me i just uh, tell them to start in small steps because the thing is they are so used to this convenience that they are overwhelmed with the things they have to do oh my god i have to do this much things i have to buy this much like for a person who has an ibs has to basically avoid certain types of food so you have to be very careful he cannot even have a grain of that like for example gluten if the gluten is in his food that it 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 triggers the autoimmunity thing for that person and then the person will think oh i just ate a little bit of this and this gave me this problem right and you are not giving the time for the body to heal that is one thing i have noticed and then uh, you just think like oh after 3 days you are seeing the symptoms no not maybe because of that food so these are few things i have noticed right so that is one thing then as you told over snacking why do you over snack there's a reason for it right you are not having a proper meal that is why you over snack if you have a proper breakfast in the morning you don't feel hungry up to 1 or 2 o'clock it's because your breakfast is not proper you are not having the right amount of protein or it is not so the what i have seen in the school going kids and all they come up with all this uh, processed uh, cereals right it has lot tons of sugar at least 6 uh, to 7 uh, spoons of teaspoon of sugar in a cereal bowl and once they eat it they go to school 10 o'clock they are hungry why is that hunger right so so they are not having that uh, satiety and then they feel hungry so these are few things that we have to notice what what goes in that product and how how they are marketing the product right so when kids see a uh, Uh, advertisement they they just want to have that cereal for breakfast <laughs> they have to switch to the real food <laughs> not like food like products right so yeah that is one thing and uh, other than that yeah doing a regular uh, like regular walking yoga getting out being with other people that is also important that is very important because when you start feeling lonely right the emotions that all affect your health so i think uh, you should have a what is it the attitude of uh, helping others being in a community doing something meaningful in your life right rather than cribbing and complaining about life that is what is very important i feel <laughs> thank you <laughs> Thank you so much Seema. There were three things that I found really nice in what Seema said and I'd like to just elaborate on those three things. The first that she said was the connection between body and mind. You will find that a lot of people who are obese or are suffering from metabolic syndrome and increase inflammation, they often have an underlying psychological issue. They may be suffering from stress, anxiety, not sleep they are often not sleeping well they may have obstructive sleep apnea already a lot of their feeding could be related to their mental health they are doing comfort feeding whenever they feel stressed they eat something whenever they feel depressed they eat something and this all goes back to childhood you know when a baby is crying the first thing you do is put a little pacifier in the mouth you put a give that baby a bottle of milk food is always used as a comfort even from when you're a baby 
And the other thing that um, Seema said about children, I found very, very fascinating and interesting because a lot of these bad habits do start in infancy and in childhood. And childhood obesity is a very important topic that we, we need to talk about. It's uh, all those, um, although their metabolism is different to ours, clearly they do need more carbs, clearly they do need more energy. We do still have to be careful about the amount of sugars we are giving children as well. Childhood obesity is on the rise. Like Seema said, that cereal, if, uh, with, which is six spoons of sugar in the morning, may not be the best for them. We also probably need to give them an omelette, egg omelette as well, to get some fat inside there, some, some proteins inside there as well. So we need to mix up their breakfast a bit better, and we need to be more mindful about the kinds of habits that we give our children. In our obesity talk, we talked about not feeding children in front of an iPad or in front of a TV because the connection between their mind and their stomach of when they are full, it goes away. They're just told to finish everything there with regardless of whether they feel full or not. And they don't, they're not even respecting their food or even um, having any semblance of food time or family time. They're just eating what's in front of them while they're watching their television. And that is unhealthy for them. And that will lead to problems later on in life. And the third thing that Seema talked about, which I've really found fascinating was, you know, patients taking responsibility. So many patients will come to you and say, just give me that pill so I can lose my weight, or just give me some bariatric surgery so I can lose my weight. And, and I explained to them, Weight loss is not just for the cosmetic side. It's not just for you to look better. Weight loss is also about becoming healthier. And when you exercise more, when you eat better, when you eat less junk, when you eat more healthy things, which are antioxidants with vitamins, it is not just that you will lose weight, you will become a healthier person. So we have to set the goalpost correctly. The, the, goal, the goal is not to look better, which you can probably achieve through bariatric surgery or some kind of fat loss pill, the goal is to become a healthier person and look better at the same time. To be healthier, not just on the outside, to be healthier on the inside as well. And so patients taking responsibility of their health, being accountable for their actions, and then and following through, that's very important. So let's, let's do some closing statements. Uh, I'm sure all of you would have some things to add, and then we'll probably, um, uh, uh, we've, we've been going for more than one hour, so we'll probably then close. Any closing statements, anyone? I'll just open to everyone. So a healthy, healthy mind, uh, a healthy body gives a healthy mind, right? So how body and mind are connected. It is very important, right? If you, the thing is, if you are healthy, your thoughts will be good. Like you want to help others. You feel that thing, right? Within you. Yeah, I have to do something. If you're struggling with your health, you cannot help anybody. That is one thing that I have found, right? And then you won't uh, find people who are like-minded like you, like helping other people. So in my practice, what I've seen, I have people who are like-minded and they go to an extent to help others, right? So for some people, uh, some uh, like food, not um, the thing is, uh, they have some type of sensitivity to certain type of food and then they think oh it's so difficult i cannot eat anything in life with some alternatives right at the same time if you tell yeah you have to avoid these things you have sensitivity to a list of ingredients then they are like oh my god there's nothing for me to eat that emotional thing comes into their head so we support them by giving the alternatives how they can go do a type of grocery that won't have any effect on their like support their healing process quicker right so that's one thing mm, other than that uh, recently i had a person who has a chronic kidney disease uh, and i was doing a meal planning so for planning for a person who has a chronic uh, kidney disease it's very challenging because you have to avoid so many things right so you have to find alternatives based on that it's one of our challenging thing. And the person who wants to do, the thing is the person should also have that mindset. Yes, I have to do it. I always ask them, why do you want to feel healthy in the first place? What is that, right? Then that will be for the children or that will be, they want to do many things in things that they are not able to do, right? So that motivation should be always there. I have to do this, yes. 
it's for my kids so i have to be better myself then only i can take care of other kids uh, that's the thing right that motivation should be always there so i always ask them why do you really want, want to do this? Is it that you want to look better or you want to feel better inside right that is important all right any closing statements from ashish and parents before we close off today ashish 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 and for oh also oh. happy birthday ashish once again from all of us have a great day ahead again thank you happy birthday ashish happy birthday. bless you thank you thank you uh no nothing nothing uh, from me um i i have just you know found a few ways uh, and it's it's different for everyone because everyone is a different human being i have a, a cert i need a lot of food <laughs> so what what i have done is i broke my meal intake into because i need snacks also have eggs in the morning and then oat around 10 o'clock and then little bit of food and then salad one thing i have found is a lot of people like indians we cook vegetables and six uh let's say uh green pepper red pepper we cook and they become this much and then we eat them with the uh, chapatis and rotis so instead of that one if you put just raw red peppers in your salad um few florets of broccoli and few florets of raw florets of um, of um, a cauliflower it will be so fulfilling that you won't be hungry for next 4 hours so um sometime it's experimenting also but i have a couple of uh, questions um one is uh, seema ji you mentioned uh, in your presentation that um those who are on blood thinner should consult their doctor for uh, curcumin or uh, turmeric intake why is that one is it they are opposed opposing it? sorry you are on mute curcumin also acts like a blood thinner so you don't want the blood to be more thin than what it exactly is oh. so the therapeutic dosage like for example when you use it in cooking that's okay but when you buy a capsule the dosage will be higher so you don't want see, there are always uh, when you are taking a herbal supplement and when you are taking a prescription there will be always the drug interactions between both of them so you don't want your body to get into that so if you are taking curcumin and something as a blood thinner that both will make your blood more don't want that to happen yeah, yeah. but it's always better to consult your physician be before starting anything that is very important okay. now um dr rawat um fructose is um the main culprit here that's what i would say so what are the ingredients you watch when you buy any of these uh, you know packed food or processed meat would it be written fructose or are there other ingredients also written there or maybe see imagine you may uh any sorry uh, i just muted you <laughs> see you you go after me so uh is very difficult actually ashish you know because because now high fructose corn syrup is becoming a bit of a you know dirty word and more people are becoming aware of it a lot of people are now starting to hide it often they will write sugar or they will just write syrup or something which is very innocuous and you can't really see just a few years ago you would have high fructose corn syrup written on it now it's not there and so you we're now becoming more and more reliant on people like seema to tell us what things do contain high fructose corn syrup some things are given uh, salad, certain types of salad dressings uh, sweet and yogurts ice cream most of these um, carbohydrate preserved things which you keep in the fridge they often cause it but i'll just um, pass it on to seema because i think this is a very good question seema what things contain high fructose corn syrup yeah so the thing is uh when you are looking at the ingredients uh, list right uh the marketing people are very 
uh, they have changed the way they market because they know that people are aware of few certain things in a different way. They won't be uh, now. They know that high fructose corn syrup is one of the problem problem ingredient. Like people look for that, so they change it to some other name. And then then the thing is, when you research more about that ingredient, you know that is worse than that. So so they they come up with all these things, right? Like for example, preservatives. They will have a lot of preservatives, but I'm now I don't remember the name of some preservatives. The coloring agents that they add, right? So the food scientists they will sit and they will study about this. Letting so they will try to find out. Okay, so we are making this uh, uh, like popcorn or something like this. Uh, what is the amount of color we have to add, or come out amount of uh, preservative we have to add, so that they they won't fall sick. So this is what the food scientists do, and they have they know how to trick your brain, right? So if you eat one. You will take more, so that is how it works. So you have to be careful on all the ingredients. Do your own research. That is that that is very important. Sometimes they mis misguide you in such a way that they will uh, say the one teaspoon will contain this much, and then you think, oh, this this box, this container has lot of oh, that's less sugar. So that is how they do. Right for the bottle of uh, juice and everything, you think, oh, it's only three grams of sugar, but then you see, oh, it's only half a cup. Half a cup is only three grams of sugar. Then the whole bottle will be like cups, and times three, then it will be fifteen. So they won't write the whole thing. So that is how they trick you. So you have to be careful on that also. Thank you. Thank you. But Seema, give us some practical examples of things which we know will contain high fructose corn syrup. Because this is something I have been challenged with myself. Because I look at the labels and they these days they don't label any anymore. They will write the thing, sugar or something like that. I have seen most of the bakery products like pastries, then sauces, then uh, uh, syrup, uh, syrup, uh, then uh, all this cooking like uh, cooking or not oils, but um, the different types of sauces. What you get right? They have this uh, high fructose corn syrup. I've seen that. Yeah, this because the corn is easily available and it's a GMO corn, and so this is everything is because of yeah that that's the thing, uh, and they they can make it in plenty, right? The corn syrup. I think also the soft drinks, soft drinks also contain that. Now, yeah. Sorry. Corn syrup, uh, and, and I know a lot of uh, recipes these days, they use uh, mm. corn flour also for thickening. Is the corn flour similar to corn syrup or corn syrup is a concentrated version of corn flour? So corn flour uh, for cooking and all, yeah, some recipe calls for corn flour. Like corn flour, it's better always go for organic corn flour. Because I've seen, because I have tried with myself, I use the other version of corn flour and it really, it doesn't agree with me at all. So then I switched to the organic one because corn in America is genetically modified. That is a thing. Unless and otherwise they say it is non-genetic, it's non-GMO corn, made from a non-GMO corn, then it is okay. Question, right? Dr. Rawat, for you. Um, this fatty liver, um, uh, it can be caused by, I think, hepatitis or virus also. So would taking, so would taking hepatitis A, B, C um, vaccination will protect against the fatty liver? No, it's their different causes. You know, one is virus and one is food. That's right. Um, so, in fact, I would, I would word it slightly differently. Um, cr chronic hepatitis C, hepatitis B, thalassemia, Wilson's disease. Th these are all conditions, autoimmune hepatitis. These are all conditions which are in the differential. So when we see that there was some inflammation going on chronically in the liver, these are things that we would be testing for to find. 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't exactly say that they cause fatty liver. I would say they're part of the differential saying that when there is some underlying inflammation in the liver due to a different cause, say chronic viral infection, then they can start you can, as a reaction the liver can start storing more fat as well. So however strictly speaking I would put it in the differential list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Daddy, mommy, do you have any closing statements before we finish? Thank you so uh, much. <laughs> well, uh, I'll add uh, two things. In eating um, moderation, one uh, is moderation. One has to be moderate in eating, in speaking, in sleeping, in whatever he is or she is doing. Second thing, we should eat what our body uh, body's requirements are what, what our tongue demands and there is one question now uh, to Sima I think perhaps uh, we eat uh, fresh corn talked about uh, corn syrup so I would like uh, if you make uh, some clarification about this thing whether this is also bad Fresh corn is also bad. Oh, fresh corn is good. See, fresh corn is good. That is what I am telling, right? The thing is now, uh, because of the conventional farming thing, the corn what we used to get before, at least in North America I am talking about, is, uh, is modified in such a way that uh, the thing is, uh, when you eat, a, when you are buying a corn from a market and you, you know it is not genetically modified, it is good for you. But when you look at corn syrup, what they use to make in all this uh, sauces and jellies and everything, it is more in a concentrated form. Anything in a concentrated form is not good for us. Right? So it is more concentrated. That corn, uh, uh, corn syrup is in the more concentrated form. And the thing is, when you eat a... See, uh, previously people used to go, they used to eat corn and all. They did not have any problem, but because there are a lot of studies that showed because th there was one study. I still remember about that study because uh, th uh, the study was stating that um, they used to make hot dogs and for the hot dogs, what they used to do, they used to take the casing from the pig's intestine. OK, the study was like this. The pigs were fed the GMO corn and what they found out is the the pigs who were fed the gmo corns had holes in their intestines that that is how bad it was and when they used it for casing they they came to know oh my god how bad it is for the pigs then to human beings try to understand so this is what is the study was trying to tell right and people don't realize over a period of time if they start consuming things that make hole in the intestine that is like it's more like a leaky a leaky gut disease then then everything slowly comes out the autoimmune sets in everything so that is what uh, i'm telling right if it is an organic one i think there is not a problem eating a corn it won't do anything bad but corn syrup when they make it it is from that gmo thing right so you don't want that concentrated form of gmo in your system I'll just, I'll just um, make, a, from my point of view, it comes down to, like Seema said, the excessive refinement and concentration of it. So it would be like comparing fruit to fruit jam. So you would think, well, is fruit jam or marmalade as good as fruit? No, because of two reasons. One, when a fruit is in its, in its natural form, it contains a lot of covalent bonds and other kinds of complex it's a complex sugar so the body needs time to break it down hence the the speed with which the sugar goes into your bloodstream is slow and steady and that's what you want after all we do need sugar sugar is the electricity of our body it's the energy that we have in our body however when you break all the bonds down and turn it into a refined processed industrialized fruit marmalade or fruit jam it becomes you can see the consistency is so smooth because it can all the bonds have been broken down 
it's turned into a simple sugar, a simple carbohydrate. It has a high glycemic index. Hence, once it goes in, it, your sugar shoots up straight away, damaging you, and then it comes down, so you feel hungry again. So it doesn't provide the satiety that you need to stop you from snacking again after two hours. So the, I would compare corn versus corn syrup to fruit versus fruit jam or fruit marmalade. It is the refinement, the processing uh, during the industrial process which makes a good thing bad. Originally it's a good thing, but the processing makes it a bad thing. Great, I think we've had a good uh, session today. So let me just do some closing statements and then we can finish. We've been going on for almost one and a half hours now. So uh, at the end, I would just like to request everyone to please share, share this on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on YouTube, um, like the video. And we've been doing a series. We've been spending a lot of time on this. Uh, me and Seema, the, our nutritionist, we've, this is our third video to together. We've done a video before this two weeks ago on obesity management. A few weeks before that, we did a, a video on reducing inflammation. I'm sure we'll come up with more videos as well going forwards. But you know, let's face it, if I just wanted to um, do a video on the conspiracy theory on vaccines, I would probably get a lot more likes, a lot more subscriptions, a lot more views. We want to just spread good information on how people can help live a healthy life. And uh, the way that you can help is by sharing, uh, liking, commenting and spreading the word. Uh, because this is just a genuine uh, effort to try to make people healthier. So thank you for everyone who joined in and we'll see everyone again next week.